What's up guys, this episode I want to talk about using vanilla JavaScript as an alternative to jQuery, especially moving forward as Rails 5.1 removes jQuery as a dependency uh, by default. You'll still probably use it in a lot of applications, especially ones that need good backwards compatibility because jQuery was really introduced as a compatibility layer across your browsers because JavaScript operated very differently than it does today in modern browsers. So with that said, we're going to talk about some various different things like how do you do queries um, for elements on the page, how do you add events, how do you hide and show items just like you would do with jQuery, and so on. So let's dive into this and begin. Now the first most common thing you want to do oftentimes is to grab items from the DOM um, and query for them so that you can interact with them in some way. So take this example, um, we have a ID notifications, which is a wrapper around each of those notifications on the page. So this is where we can grab and interact with all of those notifications. So for example, if you wanted to insert a new one from WebSocket or an Ajax request, you should be able to grab this ID notifications and then either prepend or append your item into that list. So if we go into the console, how do we grab that item? Well, Previously, you would say notifications and pass that into the dollar sign uh, for jQuery. And so jQuery would take this and see this and say, okay, that's an ID. We need to then go and look for an element on the page with the ID of notifications. Now, we can do the same thing by saying document dot query selector. And we also have a method called query selector all. The difference between the two is that query selector will give you the very first item and that item by itself, or query selector all will give you every single item and return an array. Now we are interacting with an ID, which means query selector is what we want. And here we can pass in the exact same string. And if we run that, we will get that element back. Now, if we were to run query selector all, we get an array back, and this is probably more uh, similar to the way that jQuery worked because it would probably um, handle these always as arrays. So you might want to use query selector all, but um, if you ever know that you're only looking for a single item, I would just go ahead and use query selector. Now, this also supports the multi-parameter syntax that uh, jQuery does. So if you ever wanted to grab all the paragraph tags out of the notifications div, you can run query selector all and it will return you that array and have narrowed down that scope to the appropriate section. So it will grab each one of those out there for you and have the exact same syntax. So you can use query selector and query selector all as a replacement for your jQuery selectors, which is really nifty. Now there's a couple other options that you have in case you wanna use them. You can use get element by ID, elements by class name, by name, and by tag name. And there's a couple other methods here that you can use as well. But these are alternatives if you want to directly access an element by ID. And so you can pass this in and say notifications without that syntax and it will know immediately that you were looking for an item by ID. Now you can mix and match these together. So if you ever want to grab an element and then grab children out of it, you can do the exact same thing here by saying query selector all and do P after that. And it will do the exact same chained uh, and scope, scoped queries that way as well. So that works the exact same way as if you did a find in jQuery on another element, so you're looking for children inside. So that works pretty much the exact same way and is how you would convert your jQuery code over to these new selectors. Of course, once you've added your selectors, usually you wanna interact with those elements in some way, and a lot of times that is by adding event listeners to those things. So for example, TurboLinks looks for all those pa uh, links on the page and then it will make them navigate with TurboLink. So it installs an event listener on click um, and that will intercept that stuff. 
um, or if it doesn't do an on click, it does very, something very much like that. So let's work on building our own that intercepts that. So the difference here is that we can do our query selector all, and we can grab all of the links on the page and we can use the new add event listener method to create our event listener. But the difference here is that this is gonna give us an array back and we actually need to loop over each item in the array and add the event listener to it directly. Whereas previously, if you use jQuery, you could say on click run this function and it would run that function and do whatever you wanted inside of it. And this would internally loop across all of those anchor tags on the page. So we have to explicitly do that with vanilla JavaScript. So the way we would do that is say, query selector all, grab all the anchors, and then we can say for each, and that will take a function which grabs us our uh, anchor and passes it in and optionally it also gives you the index if you need it but we don't in this case so we're going to leave it out then with that anchor you can say add event listener and it takes a function which also gives you an event on click and so then we can close these out and so we can do the exact same here as we normally would we can say event dot prevent default and that will cancel out any of the bubbling up, so this would prevent turbo links from running if we prevent default. And then here we can say console.log clicked, and we'll have that run instead. So let's uh, let's fix this. We need on click here uh, for the name. And now if we click on any of these, it will say clicked and it won't navigate away. And so then we could use that to fire off an Ajax request or something like that and prevent the normal click action from functioning. So this is a lot more code than the jQuery version that you would have written previously, but it does the exact same thing and we basically grab all of those elements and add an event listener to it. Now, if you only had one, you can shorten this because you don't need the for each anymore. And you could say query selector, and grab the very first item and then add your event listener onto it directly. But because if there's multiple ones, we actually have to loop through every single one. So that is how you can go and add event listeners the pretty much the exact same way as you would do in jQuery. You just have to run a loop across all of them instead. Now often another thing that we would do in our JavaScript is we would use jQuery and we would say, let's get the notifications thing and we would hide it or show, and that would add a style of display block or display none to our elements. Now, we don't have access to that, of course, in vanilla JavaScript, but if we do our query selector and we get notifications, and we call style.display equals none, we can hide that and we can do the exact same thing by making it a block or an inline block or whatever. And so this is going to add something to our style, uh, our inline style on that div. And that will be doing the exact same thing that jQuery hide and show did um, if you ever use that. So this would be your alternative for jQuery's hide and show methods in vanilla JavaScript. Another thing you might want to do is you might want to insert a new notification from a Rails Ajax request or from WebSockets when they send you the HTML for it and you just want to take that HTML and insert it into the page in the proper spot. So that would usually be pretty easy with jQuery. You would just say um, notifications, append, and your HTML snippet and that would do a lot of all that work for you. What we have to do this time is use this method called document.createRange, create contextual fragment, and this is where you would give it that uh, code and that HTML snippet, and then you would create this node and you would say document.querySelector, grab notifications again, and we would append child that node. So what that's going to do is it's going to parse the HTML and create a fragment 
for us to insert into the page as an actual DOM element. And we now have that appended to that list. I didn't include the anchor tag and all of that stuff, um, but that will do exactly the same thing. So you have very much the exact same functionality that you would use in normal jQuery code, but just a little bit of restructuring for using vanilla JavaScript. Now the other thing, of course, you would probably wanna do here is if you're inserting a new item, you wanna add the same event listener to that new item as you did before when you set up the page and install the event listener for all of the ones that are pre-existing on the page. Another incredibly common feature that we use often is we add data attributes and other attributes into our HTML so we can easily grab that stuff and load it into our JavaScript. And so I'm going to show you how we would do that with vanilla JavaScript. So normally you would grab an element on the page and you would say data ID and that would grab the data ID attribute which would be set to some number and that would grab that for you. But if you were doing this with regular vanilla JavaScript, you can say, let's grab that item. So let's grab the very first anchor tag on the page, which has a data attribute. So with this, you can call data set and then the name of your property. Um, and for us, we're using data ID. And so we will grab that and get this string of one back. And so these will always be strings, whereas jQuery would actually run json.parse on that stuff for you. So if you ever need to do that, you can do the same thing. Pass in that uh, attribute into json.parse and that will parse it out and give you the value as a native JavaScript object, uh, in this case, an integer. So that is an easy, easy way to do that. But these are accessible, like most of these things that we're doing are accessible in more modern JavaScript. So the data set stuff is maybe not the most browser compatible way, but you can also do get attribute and you can simply say data ID and it will grab you the exact same thing because data attributes are nothing special. They are just prepended with data and a hyphen in front of the name. And so those have their own data set method if you want to use it, but you absolutely do not have to. You can use the get attribute method, which will be a little bit more agnostic, but a little bit more verbose in accessing those. So it depends on how you want to go about that. Either method is going to work just fine. Last but not least, probably the most painful thing to write yourself is Ajax requests. And if you're not using a library like Axios, and you're just writing your own XML HTTP request objects, it can be real bare to write and set up. So Rails UJS that comes with Rails 5.1, which we talked about in a previous episode, um, comes to the rescue for us here. So rather than writing your .ajax or get JSON or post request from uh, jQuery, you can now use the rails.ajax method, and this is just going to take a object where you have the URL that you want to send to. So let's say notifications.json. And you also have to pass in a type, which is required. And we can say, for example, get. And this is going to run an Ajax request. And we see uh, nothing special here. But if we look in our console, we see get notifications.json. And that returned it back to us. So we can go into this and add a success callback here just like before and we will receive the data back and so if we do that then we can create a function here that maybe just console.logs all those notifications that we have in the database so let's console.log that and you will see right here that we get all of those objects back which is one for each one of these notifications in our database so the rails.ajax method for the most part has the same sort of syntax for the URL and the method and the success and that sort of thing. It's a little bit different. Some of the option names are a little bit different, but for the most part, this is going to work exactly the same way that the jQuery Ajax method worked previously, but this will also take advantage of the CSRF token from Rails. It will grab that out of the head and then include that with all of your Ajax requests automatically. So you don't have to worry about doing any of that stuff anymore. 
And if you're interested, you can watch episode 186 on the Rails UJS primer. I walk through everything that that Rails UJS library does and talk about the changes and the features and how they work and specifically the Rails Ajax request. We look at the source code for it so you can see exactly all of the options that you can pass in and how those get handled in the XML HTTP request that it builds internally and then executes for you. So if you're interested in that, check out episode 186 for more information on the rails.ajax method. Now before we wrap up, the last thing that I wanted to point out is that you've seen me write document.add event listener in previous episodes where we listen to the Turbolinks load event. So anytime that the document fires that event where Turbolinks defines this event and says, hey, we're going to fire that and so you can listen to it and set this up so that anytime you click on links, it's going to fire that console log message or do whatever code you want. For example, our Vue.js stuff, we had it set up so that it would load up our Vue app every single time that we load the page and then we would tear down Vue just before it gets cached when we navigate away so that it can be loaded up again when you come back without any issues. So that wraps up this episode. Of course, we can't dive into every jQuery method that's available. There are far, far too many to use, but jQuery is becoming less and less required these days. It used to be that if you wanted this to work in multiple browsers, you pretty much had to use jQuery. And as you can see, the browsers have very good APIs. You've just got to learn those new APIs so that you can write your vanilla JavaScript and replace jQuery with it. So as you notice, most of those things are pretty easy to transfer from jQuery syntax over to the browser's APIs, except for some little details like you need to do your own JSON parsing, or you need to do your own looping around these elements in order to add those event listeners. Maybe those things will improve in the future, but really it's kind of trivial little stuff. You just have to worry about doing those things yourself here and there, and it's not too bad. So that is it for this episode. Hopefully that gives you a better understanding of how you would go convert your jQuery code over to vanilla JavaScript and hopefully drop that dependency moving forward. So until next time, I will talk to you later. Peace.